Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. We're selling warships to Ukraine. Is, does this mean that there is going to be increased tensions with Russia? Is war on the cards? Also, the integrated rail strategy is being announced later this morning. Does this mean the North is going to be betrayed? Will there be a new rail line connecting the cities of the North or not? And is Mr Speaker Lindsay Hoyle, is he becoming too Burkonian in the way he's interacting in Parliament? We'll discuss all of this in five minutes after your news. Good morning, I'm Simon Fusey. This is your news at nine o'clock. Boris Johnson is insisting that Leeds could still be connected to the HS2 high-speed rail line in the future as the government publishes its integrated rail plan later today. It's expected to confirm that the eastern leg of HS2 between the East Midlands and Leeds is being cancelled. The plan will also feature £96 billion of investment in the Midlands and the North. The Prime Minister says it will mean faster journeys to more places more quickly. But Labour says the North has been been shortchanged. Everything that's been briefed out over the last few days, I'm afraid, points to a gross betrayal of trust. You know, after years now of being promised that we are going to get HS2, that we're going to realise the ambition for Northern Powerhouse Rail, and at the 11th hour for the money to be snatched away, I'm afraid, is cruel. It's a betrayal too far. Coronavirus rates in England are similar to what they were in January this year, just after the peak of the second wave. An Imperial College London study found around one in 10 COVID cases in England are now a Delta variant, which scientists say is more likely to result in asymptomatic infection. Ministers are hoping to seal an agreement to fly channel-crossing migrants from the UK to Albania. That's according to The Times newspaper. The reports it would cost £100,000 per asylum seeker. Under the plans, illegal arrivals on Britain's beaches would be taken to Albania within seven days to wait there while their claims for asylum in the UK are processed. The idea is this would act as a deterrent against making the crossing. Last Thursday, 1,185 people reached Britain, breaking a daily record. A government plan to ban paid consultancy work has been approved by MPs after a Commons vote last night. The ayes to the right, 297. The noes to the left, zero. So the, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. MPs voted down the Labour motion. That would have seen the Standards Committee making proposals on the ban, with MPs able to debate and then vote on them. The Prime Minister says it was a mistake to conflate Owen Paterson's lobbying case with the case for reform. Conservative MP Ben Bradley says he regrets voting for the Standards Reform on the 3rd of November. Well, I knew that Owen, um, obviously clearly the report had um, found significant evidence that Owen had crossed those lines. Um, I. We all had those conversations with government, with the Whips office, and they explained the reason they thought this was the right thing, and, and we kind of agreed and, and went along with that. But clearly, in hindsight, and particularly, you know, quite frankly, we all make mistakes, um, there was a significant outcry off the back of it, and that makes you start to have a look and rethink and, and think, have we done the right thing here? Alec Baldwin is facing a second lawsuit over the fatal shooting on the film set Rust. Crew member Mamie Michelle claims the script never called for a gun to be fired during the scene where cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. Director Joel Souza was also injured in the incident. The lawsuit also claims that the behaviour of the actor and producers was reckless. In our opinion, Mr Baldwin chose to play Russian roulette when he fired a gun without checking it, and without having the armorer do so in his presence. 
there was no script that called for him to discharge a gun. And in response, Alec Baldwin's lawyers had no immediate comment to those allegations. An insulate Britain protester who's been jailed for breaching a High Court injunction preventing her from blocking roads is on a hunger strike. 44-year-old Emma Smart was handed a four-month sentence for taking part in a blockade on the M25 in October. Nine other activists have received sentences ranging from three to six months. Insulate Britain's spokesperson Craig Scudder told GB News the group will continue to protest. The person that will die of winter fuel death every 15 minutes this winter. You know, we're the sixth richest country in the world. That's just not acceptable. We've got to stay on the roads. We've got to stay trying to hold the government's feet to the fire until they take action. The government are breaking the social contract, not us. The first ever long-acting injection to treat HIV has been approved by the NHS. It's estimated 13,000 people in England living with the virus will be offered the jab. Charities have hailed the news as incredible, as adults will no longer need to take daily tablets, but will have two injections every two months. Well, that's it for me. I'll be back with the headlines in around half an hour's time. For now, it's back to Tom Harwood. Hello and welcome to The Briefing. We have three big stories to discuss today, <clears throat> not least of all, the announcement that's being expected at 10.30 this morning. Let's dive straight in. At 10.30, we will finally see the government's integrated rail strategy. It's expected to ditch new lines in favour of cheaper upgrades to existing lines across the north. Some of the Prime Minister's foreword to the strategy has already been published. He has written that, quote, Some have demanded that we rigidly stick to the old plans, however long they take and however much they cost, and whoever they leave behind. But those who say that things are, in effect, condemning the North and the East Midlands to getting nothing for 20 years, levelling up, cannot wait that long. That's the spin that the Prime Minister is placing upon the decision that the Northern Powerhouse Rail, as it was called, HS3 as some called it, connecting those cities of the North with new lines, that is no longer going ahead. Well, we'll hear all about it in a couple of hours' time, but to preview what it means and what is being expected and how the North really feels about this, I'm delighted to be joined now by Martin Tugwell, the Chief Executive of Transport for the North, who joins me now from Manchester. Welcome to the programme. Um, first of all, this seems like a huge bit of back backpedalling from what the Conservatives promised in their election campaign. Well, first of all, it's great to be able to join you this morning. And of course, uh, we've still yet to see the full detail of the plan. Um, but I think it's very clear from the TFM board's perspective that what we set out was a comprehensive, integrated package that would transform the North's railway system and help deliver the economic uh, potential of the North, giving people and businesses opportunities that they currently don't have. And that's our benchmark, if you like, the preferred plan that we set out. And so um, re re seeing the uh, reports in the, uh, the papers and the media over the last couple of days, I think it's fair to say it's a combination of concern and disappointment uh, amongst the political leaders and indeed the business leaders. It seems interesting that, of course, HS1 was built in the southeast, connecting London with the southeast and indeed France quite a while ago. We've got HS2 uh, now ploughing ahead, connecting Birmingham and London. But then when it comes to connecting cities like Manchester and Leeds uh, and, and Liverpool, indeed, up, up in the north, it seems that things have been scaled back. Does this seem consistent with a message of levelling up? Well, what we know from the work we've done, and, and I have to say the work we've done working with the, uh, the government in, the, uh, in developing those plans for Northern Powerhouse Rail proposals was very much evidence-based. We understand the economic potential. We understand the importance of transforming connections between our great towns and cities, not just between Leeds and Manchester, but actually from Liverpool across to Hull, from Sheffield up to Newcastle. It's a fully integrated network that we're looking for. And at the heart of that proposal was the recognition that to get the transformation, 
you need to build new lines. You need to build a new line connecting Manchester and Bradford and Leeds so that you don't have the disruption whilst you're upgrading existing lines and still continuing to uh, allow people and businesses to go about their daily lives. That's a really interesting point there and one that I actually hadn't considered on the disruption point because of course the Prime Minister's argument this morning appears to be that if we went to build new lines we wouldn't see the benefits for 20 years, that it would be very expensive and we could see benefits sooner by doing in incremental upgrades to existing lines. But you're saying that potentially incremental upgrades might make things worse in the short term even if it improves things in the medium term. Well, we know from experience, don't we, that um, if you're looking to upgrade existing railway tracks, you have to do it when uh, people aren't needing to use them. And the trouble here is that, um, unlike the rest of the country, we've seen passengers return to our existing rail services much faster than the rest of the country. Some of our pa uh, train operators are now reporting um, re passenger levels about 80, 85% of pre-COVID levels. If I look at the freight demand, um, freight paths are fully committed across the region. This is a sign of how the rail network is so important to the north. It's also a sign of the limitations of our existing two-track Victorian railway infrastructure, which is why consistently the board has set out the importance of transformational infrastructure, actually integrating infrastructure. So our proposals for between the link between Sheffield and Lees deliberately chose to integrate what was being done with HS2 so that we use it also for the Northern Powerhouse Rail uh, services as well. It's a, it's a fully integrated approach that we were setting out. It's interesting to see that currently the government has been pretty coy. There have been uh, announcements in some newspapers, but the way that this is trying to be spun is that this is a grand big improvement for the North. Do you accept that there is more investment coming to the North? Perhaps not as much as was promised initially, but things will be getting better. Well, it's undoubtedly good to see the investment. And we saw some of the announcements at the budget about the investments in the uh, city regions. And we've got work already ongoing in upgrading the existing Trans-Pennine route between Manchester and Leeds. But we've consistently said we've got to take a longer term view here. What is the economic potential of the North? And we saw that being set out very clearly in the original uh, Northern Powerhouse Economic Review. A hundred billion increase in the economy. 850,000 jobs, the delivering the houses that are in the people's plans at a local level. All of that requires transformational infrastructure. And the simple message is, the sooner you start delivering the transformational infrastructure, the sooner you start realizing the benefits for the residents and the businesses, and you see the, the, the wealth and the growth uh, of the North coming through and supporting the rest of the country. Well, it will be very interesting to see whether the go government's argument that a cheaper cost to taxpayers and more immediate delivery is better or a slightly higher capital investment and better stuff in the long term is actually what the country needs. I, I wonder that there's probably a problem here in elected politics in that politicians always have a short term view. They're looking to the next five years rather than the next 25 years. Um, but... I wonder how much that's played into the announcement today. We wait until 10.30 to see all of the detail. But for now, Martin Tugwell, Chairman of, uh, Chief Executive of Transport for the North, thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Briefing. Now, yesterday was a noisy day in the Commons. There was, of course, Prime Minister's questions. The Prime Minister faced a lot of problems at the Liaison Committee. Indeed, the Prime Minister had problems from his own side at the 1922 Committee meeting. But something that caught my eye was the way that the Speaker of the House of Commons was behaving. Let's have a listen at how many times he interrupted the Prime Minister during Prime Minister's questions yesterday. I'm going to produce a fantastic... Oh, 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 don't... I expect the front bench to behave better than what it is doing in the moment. If you don't want to listen to the answer, let me know now. I do, and I cannot hear when you all shout together. We want better politics. I expect bol better politics from both sides. Let's show a little bit more decorum than we're seeing at the moment. Prime Minister. From his proposals, whether he would continue to be able to take money as he did from Mishcon Doraya and other legal firms. Oh, 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 order, order, Prime, Prime Minister, Prime Minister. As you know, and I do remind you, it's Prime Minister's questions, not Leader of the Opposition's questions. Keir Starmer. 25,000. Who's paying him for his... Just a minute. Prime, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. 
I don't want to fall out about it. I've made it very clear. It is Prime Minister's questions. It's not for the opposition to answer your question. Uh, whether we like it or not, those are the rules of the game that we're all into, and we play by the rules, don't we? And we respect this House, so let's respect the House. Order. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Prop. Where's Rob Roberts? Mr. Prop. And I don't think. Look, this is not good. We lost a dear friend. I want to show that this House has learned from it. I don't want each other to. I don't want each other to be shouted down. I want questions to be respected. I expect the public to actually be able to hear the questions and the answers, because I'm struggling in this chair. I need no more. Yes, Prime Minister, sit down. Prime Minister, I'm not going to be challenged. You may be the Prime Minister of this country, but in this House, I'm in charge. And we're going to carry on. End of that. Which is leading the country out of the pandemic. Order, order, order. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, just... I'm struggling to hear, and if it's correct what I've said, it was about Leader of the Opposition and misconduct. We can't or cannot accuse somebody of misconduct. Yeah. Now, I may, and I, just before the Leader of the House gives me an answer, all I'm trying to say, I cannot hear. If it was said, I want it withdrawn. If it wasn't, I will accept it. I'm just... Just, just a moment. Prime Minister. I can't. Mr. I speak, I refer to the Right Honourable Gentleman's misconduct, because that is what he's guilty of. Oh, order, order. I don't think this has done this House any good today. I'll be quite honest. I think it's been, I think it's been ill-tempered. I think it shows the public that this House has not learned from the other week. I need this House to gain respect, but it starts by individuals showing respect to each other. The Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, there, uh, interrupting over a short period of time quite a bit. That exchange lasted 10 minutes, and I think that was about three minutes of Lindsay Hoyle speaking there, almost a third of the time that, uh, that the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition had to talk to one another was taken up by the Speaker. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined now by the political commentator and writer, Benedict Spence. Welcome to the programme, Benedict. Um, Lindsay Hoyle was elected as Speaker of the House of Commons by a large number of Conservatives mm. who thought that John Burko had gone too far, who thought that he was too theatrical and too intervening. Um, has Lindsay Hoyle slipped too much into that mould? I think it's heading in that direction. I think there's always a danger if you are, you know, if you think about what the Speaker of the House does, they have to sort of mediate between a lot of very big characters, a lot of very big personalities, people who will try to dominate the narrative. Of course, the Prime Minister being one of them. If only the Leader of the Opposition were one too, then perhaps Sir Lindsay wouldn't need to interject quite so much. But um, you, there, you do always sort of run the risk in having to sort of break up the spiel of certain politicians that you become the dictatorial sort of figure yourself, you become the bombastic one. I, I think Sir Lindsay Hoyle, he sort of tended towards that yesterday. You sort of saw it going in that vague direction. I don't think he overstepped the line too much, because actually I don't think he's done this very often. But the problem is, of course, once you do cross over a threshold, you begin to normalise that sort of behaviour. If you begin to have a bit more of an adversarial relationship, certainly with, the, certainly with the Prime Minister, who will try to dominate any sort of conversation, any form of PMQs, then, you know, that, that, that could be a problem going forward. Up to now, I think he's actually been quite a good speaker. Mm. But yesterday, I did think it was very noticeable. And, I mean, we, always, we all understand why that is. You know, the House is not currently in particularly good shape, good favour with most members of the public. He has a duty to sort of uphold the standards of it. But you're right, he doesn't want to become the story himself. He doesn't want to become the figure like his predecessor did. Well, absolutely. I remember when he first became Speaker in the first Prime Minister's Questions, uh, conservative-leaning websites counted the amount of time that he took up. Mm. And it was, it was just a fraction of that that John Burko took up. I wonder to what extent speakers may inevitably lean towards that role the longer they're in the chair, the more they become the prima donna. I think that's always going to be likely, ultimately, you know. I, once you have a bit, a bit of a feel of the role, so to speak, and you do feel more at home, you don't feel like you're sort of, as it were, just being tried out, you, you feel a lot more confident in your ability to interject and to then sort of writ large on whatever it is. Yes, I think that's always going to be the case. But as I say, 
Yeah, this has been not a particularly good week. I mean, I wasn't sure entirely who Sir Lindsay was referring to. Was it Owen Patterson or was it Sir David Amos mm. uh, in terms of which, you know, uh, honourable member it was that they'd lost? Yeah, that, that um, confused me. It was a very mm. interesting point because, of course, I, I mean, I, initially I thought he may have said mm. um, we shouldn't behave like this because Sir David Amos has got... which wouldn't make any sense at all because, yes. of course, that was a terrorist incident, not a matter of conduct. Well, that threw me slightly because, as you say, it was terrorist-related, but we do remember in the immediate afterwards, aftermath, uh, rather than talking about terrorism, a lot of MPs were very keen about talking about conduct online. Right. So that's why I thought perhaps this is what he was referring to, mm -hmm. and at which point you sort of roll your eyes and go, well, here we are again. But of course, he might have been referring to Mr. Patterson, who was very well liked across as by a lot of MPs, mm -hmm. um, and they have lost him, and that has unleashed sort of a deluge of allegations against other members, on which there is going to be a lot of scrutiny on how they conduct themselves. On the other side, of course, you've had uh, Labour MPs getting into hot water on other and related issues. So I can sort of understand why he might decide to go down a bit more of a sort of a tyrannical route if he feels that too many MPs are, you know, going off, going rogue, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's not something you want to become the norm, is what no. I would say. Is the Speaker just getting his own back at the government, the government that has been making all of these announcements mm. outside of the House of Commons. We've heard that the Speaker and indeed his deputy speakers have been very angry at not only the Prime Minister but also the Chancellor for yeah. pre-briefing uh, <laughs> announcements that should properly happen within the House. I mean, even today we know what the integrated rail plan is going to say, even mm. though it should be announced first in the House with the budget. Uh, almost every single measure in the budget was mm. leaked first to the press. <clears throat> and indeed, when it comes to some Covid measures, we've seen these press conferences in number 10, mm before they've been <coughs> in the House of Commons. Is mm. Lindsay Hoyle just trying to get his own back? Well, <coughs> excuse me, I wouldn't want to speak for the Speaker, not having spoken to him about this personally, not knowing him particularly well, but um, you wouldn't rule it out. You know, there is... There is an element that sometimes this government does sort of ride a bit roughshod over the rules, and, you know, we saw that sort of before the election on all sorts of matters, you know, it didn't have a particularly good relationship with Parliament. Um, again, it might be the case that the Speaker is trying to sort of revert back to the primacy of the chamber itself. So I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but I would also say, more broadly, yeah, you don't want to always lay this at Labour's door because they're not the government, but there has been a complete sort of lack of tangible opposition. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you know, we did see this with John Burke. I was sort of feeling, well, if uh, the opposition aren't going to do their job, then it, it falls to me to sort of hold them some sort of account. So I wouldn't necessarily put it past them. But obviously, you, you know, not knowing personally what's going on, you don't necessarily want to say that that is absolutely the case. But there might always be that going on in the back of the mind. There was quite a lot of fervour from Keir Starmer yesterday, calling mm. the Prime Minister a coward in the Commons language that you wouldn't necessarily always uh, expect to see from, from the opposition front bench. Mm. Um, the Prime Minister was admonished by the Speaker for, for using a pun, for saying mish conduct, <laughs> as we saw in the clip earlier. Um, but, the, but the Leader of the Opposition wasn't admonished for, for calling the Prime Minister a coward. Is that a double standard? I, I, slightly it is. I mean, I found it very entertaining that the Prime Minister... That's what the Prime Minister does very well. It was a very good quip. Um, I do think, actually, though, that the Speaker had a point, which was that it is Prime Minister's questions, not Leader of the Opposition questions. And mm. very often, we do get very entertaining Prime Minister's questions. Mm. We've had it with Boris Johnson, we had it with David Cameron before, he was very good at it. Mm. The Prime Ministers can turn it into a bit of a show. But very often what happens then is that they just dodge the questions that are being asked them. And whilst a lot of supporters of the Prime Minister, the Conservatives might think that that's great because it gives them, you know, fun sort of half an hour to watch. Ultimately, this is about holding the government to account. It's not about holding the Leader of the Opposition to account. If we want to do that, perhaps there needs to be some other form of mechanism. I think, you know, plenty of members of the press do quite a good job of that anyway. Uh, were he to become Prime Minister, I'm sure all of this would be sort of laid at his door as well. Mm -hmm. But that is the primary role of this little slot. It is to ask the Prime Minister specific mm -hmm. questions about about the actions of himself and his government, and that is very important that we remember that. And just finally here, are we at risk of dulling down Prime Minister's questions too much? <laughs> Should it be noisy? The, 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 the Speaker um, told off the front bench of the Labour Party for being noisy, but really, isn't this what the whole session is designed to be? I mean, other countries around the world with their rather stale legislatures look to yeah. ours and see sort of excitement, verve. <laughs> um, is, this, is this what we should be seeing? Well, of course, sometimes you get the other direction, don't you? In certain Eastern European parliaments, very often they reduce to actually fighting themselves, which is always <laughs> very interesting. You know, we managed to straddle that quite well. We managed to sit right in the balance. But you know, the thing that often, uh, often annoys me is straight after uh, you have the leader of the opposition, you have questions from the SNP. And my word, doesn't that drone on? And you kind of wish, well, maybe Salinji could do a little bit of, you know, help us sort out and interject there to sort of speed it up or G it along a little bit. Mm. Um, I do think we get the balance right. I would like to see the Prime Minister answer more questions, but that's not just the case of Boris Johnson. It's every Prime Minister ever since Prime Minister's mm. questions have started. It is a spectacle. It is a Punch and Judy show. I don't think we want to dull it down too much.
No, the term... You want to get people involved. You the, want people to the, actually the, tune in. The term punch and duty politics is always used mm. as in, in a derogatory way, but punch and duty was quite popular. Yeah. Uh, as, as a, as a <laughs> I program. enjoyed it. I don't know I, about I, you. I, I, I think, beach I think I've only ever sort of seen thing. it once, but, um, but no, I, mean, I, I think politics to some extent should be a little bit. Why not? Well, better than expense, thank you very much for going thank through you. all of that with us this morning on The Briefing. Uh, a really interesting uh, point, and I think we'll be watching how Sir Lindsay conducts himself uh, throughout the following weeks to see if this is the start of a new trend. Well, let's return for now what I was talking about a little bit at the start of today's show with Martin Tugwell from Transport for the North. The government has been accused of betraying the North if they scrap the eastern leg of the HS2 high-speed rail link between Birmingham and Leeds, which is expected to be confirmed later this morning. The response from Number 10 is to claim their integrated rail plan will bring quicker journey times between cities like Nottingham and Leeds years earlier than planned and at a much reduced price. Well, earlier, uh, the Great British Breakfast spoke to Jim McMahon, the Labour Shadow uh, Transport Secretary, on his reactions to the response coming from Number 10. Well, everything that's been briefed out over the last few days, I'm afraid, points to a gross betrayal of trust. You know, after years now of being promised that we are going to get HS2, that we're going to realise the ambition for Northern Powerhouse Rail, and at the 11th hour for the money to be snatched away, I'm afraid, is cruel. It's a betrayal too far. Well, in a sense, that is a responsibility of government, is to invest in infrastructure that will mean that our economy can, can thrive. But let's be honest, we've had 11 years of a Conservative government that haven't made the investment, that have denied the North of England the cash that it was uh, deserving. And what we've seen is that £66 billion of money that could have gone to the North of England in the last decade under Conservative rule has not followed. And what we're getting now, I'm afraid, is a second-class deal. It's not good enough. We were promised by the Prime Minister, within a month of him being elected as Prime Minister, that we get HS2 in full, that we'd see the ambition for Northern Powerhouse Rail realised. And he promised that then, and his ministers, 60 times since. So all we want to do is to say to Boris Johnson, you know, honour your word. This has been promised. We've been working solidly, our Metro mayors, our council leaders, transport for the North and Midlands Hub, to make sure that we realise that investment for our economic success. And if we don't make that investment today, this generational responsibility, I'm afraid, will let down a whole swathe uh, of the country, and that's just not good enough. It's being betrayed. Well, let's bear in mind, of the £96 billion that's been announced part of this uh, package today, £40 billion is already committed to connect London to Crewe. That's not money for the north of England. It's not money that's going to connect uh, east to west. It's not money that's going to free up capacitor. What we need to do is to see the project through to the full ambition. And not just actually for commuter services. You know, if we're going to meet our climate change objectives, we have got to decarbonise and we've got to get freight off the road and the motorways onto rail. We can't do that if there are bottlenecks. We can't do that if we haven't got capacitor. And that's why I say this is a generational responsibility to meet our climate change objectives, to create decent, skilled, working-class jobs and to finally unlock the potential of the north of England. Well, I mean, we say it's an eye-watering cost, but these are government responsibilities. We have got to invest in the infrastructure you know, in the same way that we invest in broadband, electric car charging points, in the way that we're looking to invest in new energy supplies. This is all about making sure that the country can thrive and succeed going forward. And when you don't make that investment, what you really do is to hold the country back. You deny working-class people skilled jobs that will provide a decent level uh, of lifestyle for them and their families. And that's what we're seeing with the government. They are selling us short. And for quite a long time now, the government have promised that they'll level up, they'll realise the Northern Powerhouse, they'll create the Midlands engine. But when the test really came, when they were asked to put the money on the table, we were shortchanged. I think in Parliament there's real anger at the way that some MPs have put their own interests above the national interest, above the parliamentary uh, interests. And for those of us who play by the rules, those of us who put our constituencies first, those of us who during the pandemic were literally going door to door, swab testing, encouraging people to take up the vaccination, delivering food parcels, you know, for those of us who have been working through this to try and support the nation, the idea that there are a selective group of MPs who think that the rules don't apply to them quite rightly makes us angry. And you are seeing that being played out in Parliament, and we want to see change, because if we don't change, then it's a plague on all of our houses. The bad behaviour of a few MPs ultimately reflects on all of us. In Parliament, there's a certain protocol about what language uh, ca can be used and can't be used, and quite frankly, it's quite archaic in places. There are some words that you are allowed to say that you probably wouldn't say in polite public, and there are other words that are actually very mild uh, that you're not allowed to say in Parliament, and being a coward uh, is one of those. But outside, on the Green in Parliament, I can call Boris Johnson a coward because that's exactly what he is. Because the characteristics of Boris Johnson is that he's a ducker and he's a diver. 
He doesn't take responsibility. He doesn't believe the rules apply to him. And when he's found wanting, when his ministers are found wanting, when the rules are broken, he doesn't accept that. He doesn't concede and improve. He wants to completely take apart, to dismantle the very institutions that are there to uphold standards. That's not the way to run a country. It's not the way to operate in Parliament. I'm afraid it does speak to character. Jim McMahon there, of course, Shadow Transport Secretary, talking to the Great British Breakfast on GB News earlier today. Well, now to move on to something else. Britain has agreed a deal to sell warships and missiles to Ukraine amid rising tensions with Russia. The Defence Secretary signed the treaty with Ukraine last night in order to deliver two anti-mine vessels, eight missile ships and the delivery and retrofit of weapons to existing vessels. This all in order to beef up Ukraine's naval capabilities after 100,000 Russian troops descended on the border. There are now fears of a, an imminent invasion. An imminent invasion into Ukraine, Russian aggression, arms deals. Why aren't we talking more about this at the top of our news agendas? To me, it seems that what has happened over the last week and a half has been incredibly significant. There have been migrants poured onto the border of Poland through Belarus. There have been Russian moves against Ukraine. East and West in the east part of Europe seems to be under incredible strain. And it's not just that sort of foreign policy. There was a terrorist attack in Liverpool a week ago. There was a bomb set off outside a women's hospital. And yet we've spent the entirety of the last week talking about MPs' second jobs. I wonder to what extent this matches reality, matches the challenges that we face in a dangerous world. Potentially more should be said about what might be the build-up of war on the edge of our continent and indeed the imminent threats and violence in our own country. A car bomb is the sort of thing you expect to hear about happening in Kabul, not Liverpool. And yet, we appear to have brushed it off as if this is an everyday occurrence. These issues and these stories need greater prominence. Well, that's it that we have time for today on The Briefing. Coming up, it's To The Point with Patrick Christie's and Mercy Maroki. But before that, let's take a look at the weather. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Good morning. A little cool in places out there this morning, but overall it's going to be another pretty mild day. Mild, but... Uh, Mostly fairly drab with a lot of cloud around, but not much rain around. There will be some rain from this set of weather fronts across northern and western Scotland. And notice across Scotland, the isobars close together as well. So it is quite blustery here. Further south, high pressure is dominating, hence why it is a largely dry day. But clouds been moving in overnight. Some places, yes, waking up to a bit of sunshine, but that cloud will continue, I think, to work its way from west to east. Some drizzle over the hills and mountains of northwest England and southwest Scotland, but the wettest weather over the highlands, the northern isles, where it'll stay fairly soggy all day. Brighter skies, though, across eastern Scotland could see temperatures 15, maybe 16 degrees, and generally we're up into the teens, 13, 14 Celsius, particularly if we see some brightness across the southeast, some sunshine here through the afternoon. Through this evening, we will continue to see the clouds spilling in, so most places having a dry but cloudy night. We'll continue with some drizzle around western coast and hills, and particularly in the far northwest where it also stays pretty windy. That will keep the temperatures up, but um, everywhere is going to have a, a mild night. Many towns and cities remaining in double digits. And Friday, again then, mostly rather drab, but mild and dry. We should see some breaks again in the cloud developing to the east of hills, parts of East Wales, and later on over parts of eastern England, we should see some blue skies.